I'm Abraham Raider, and I'm filled with righteous anger. And it's not because of the gondola titers breathing my air. And it's not because I can't figure out how to efficiently get plasma to burn hot. It's not even because I have to waste time turning off the Plasma Man room's air alarm. It's because of this guy, Glacier. But I suppose we have to start a little bit earlier. I forgot to wear my ID after fixing the med bay air alarm, so the head of security starts grilling me about my papers like he's the head of Space Border Patrol. But my boy Ray sticks up for La Raza by shooting the Haas in the head with a syringe gun, getting him the fuck off. Well, that's one problem solved. People seem to be acting weird, but to be honest, I'm pretty cool with it if it means I don't have to get stopped and frisk. I take a break in the engineer lounge when our CE lets in a couple of gondolas to go stare at our department and then bullies our NG Borg. To be honest, these stations started going south when they let non-humans take command positions. All they've been doing is throwing non-fungible supermatter toys around when we, the working class, produce all the value the station has, which is basically nothing because, for example, I'm sitting on my ass right now. And there's also something in there that makes me think about class politics more than the local Trader Joe's clerk who calls me a reactionary when I tell him to stop giving me propaganda and finish bagging my groceries. But I suppose air is my department, so I start working on the turbine room's fire mixture. But unlike most fires down south, the burning goes away on its own without medical intervention. But something about having a fire extinguished and then rekindled results in it having a hotter output than the previous session. It's like the burn chamber just needs to be warmed up a little bit before it's ready to go. And then it's strange because I don't ever have this problem when I experiment on my own private server. I swear, this doesn't usually happen. But this pulsing method of burning plasma seems to have some success at producing tritium at higher temperatures than my previous experiments. To be honest though, I feel like I don't understand burning physics and why servers with time dilation seem to behave so differently from private servers. But joyously, I am given busy work to distract me from the fundamental task of understanding the world around me. The NG Borg requires a plasma container and it has no hands. There is pleasure in the pursuit of tangible outputs rather than the contemplation of the universe's secrets. Because to be honest, the universe is a cold and indifferent thing and does not care whether you understand it or not. But a canister of plasma? I can do that. Or perhaps not. In my efforts to burn the candle of knowledge brightly, I dipped my candle too carelessly. Oxygen. It now filled the plasma tank I previously fueled my experiments with. This plasma container would be a death trap for any plasma man who used it. I warned my silicon comrade of the danger and said about an alternative solution. A direct line of plasma would be the way to get him his product. But it wasn't easy. I leaked gas all over the room. But I, having dealt it, also smelt it and I set up scrubbers to fix the problem. Pressure was insufficient for the purposes of providing enough gas for plasma men to breathe. Because you see, the canister will only equal the pressure of the line. It achieves only equilibrium. But we cannot achieve our full potential by remaining equivocal to our environment. We must impose pressure upon ourselves to build greater pressure upwards in a virtuous cycle. And to reach these higher levels, we must ask sacrifices of ourselves. My leg was dislocated from its socket as my heart was relocated to the greater good. My plasma brethren would be able to breathe their own air, free of the constraints of plasma suits, thanks to my blood and tears. It is this solidarity that drives all people to work together and forge a greater society. Whether you breathe air, or something that is not air, rest assured, my friends, I will always be there to filter the contaminants from your oxygen and scrub the injustice from the world. Though the cost was great, I begrudged my fellow man, my fellow plasman, nothing. For I gave them nothing that they would not give to me, was this not so? And surely the doctors of the station would attend to my leg with the same care I extended to my cans. The NG Borg did not understand my meaning, but that was alright. It was not his place to understand. I was in need of a crutch, but there was none. Medical attention was needed. It was then that I saw the Mothman, dead in the engineering airlock. Like Icarus, he was drawn too close to the flames of knowledge and lost his head for it, I wondered. 
but though he stole the surplus value of my labor, I felt a responsibility to see to his rescue. I grabbed him, and as I carried the Mothman, I warned the other engineers that our CE was dead, and it was then I discovered the truth. There was a revolution. As I walked past the shattered brig, the stormed Bastille gates of our steel station, I realized that this was so, and I understood suddenly what it all meant. The paranoid Haas getting syringed. He wasn't motivated by tyranny towards others, but rather the tyranny of the other. He was hunted and I did not even know it. The warning from CENTCOM against paying union dues. The rechristening of our station as Viva La Station. The wheels of history turned while my turbine room burned. I wasn't a part of it. I wasn't even a spectator. I was a hermit, a monk, sequestered near my cell of fire, both apart from and left behind by the revolution. There would be no resurrection of my Mothman superior. He was one of the petty bourgeoisie. His brain wasn't even in my possession, and even if it were, what would he gain if I brought him back to life? A second execution? An exile to Lava Land? No, he was damned. But my proletariat brothers would attend to my own injury. Or at least they would if they bothered listening to me. I nearly choked on my empty oxygen tank, but my leg was soon reset. Sutures were applied, and I was back to where I was, although perhaps shaken by the violent seizing of means I had witnessed. But things spiraled out of control. Without the CE, or my experienced hand, Glacier ended up doing a bad. He put plasma in the air distribution. Sometimes giving power to the inexperienced results in things going awry. By revolving the system, it is possible to become misaligned, and in a place with a limited air supply, misalignment is not so easily realigned. To his credit, the scaly understood the scope of his mistake and when I saw how much plasma was entering the air supply, I decided to shut off the air distribution to prevent bad from going to worse. But things got stranger as I tried to fix the problem. Piping more oxygen into the feed seemed to only increase the percentage of plasma. We were now at 2.5%, enough to be flammable. How could this be? The air supply was visibly purple, like some flammable world envisioned by Prince. It was then I realized the scope of the problem. I looked at the path of the yellow pipe, what the shit? This guy actually fed the plasma line into the teal oxygen line. For what purpose, I do not know. But the AI was now aware that the station wasn't receiving fresh air. We were beginning to feel the heat from our station's decentralized, recentralized authority. The Commissar's replacement chief engineer entered atmospherics to ask what the status of the air was. He was polite enough, but I had seen what had happened previously. The threat was an undercurrent to what he said and implied punishment for betraying the workers' cause. And none of it was even my fault. I told him we couldn't turn on the air until we fixed the plasma situation, but he was insistent upon receiving oxygen. Faced with this uncompromising Catch-22, I had to rely on my own ethics. To do no harm as an atmosphere man, I would not turn on the air until the air got filtered. I resented the heat brought upon me. The lack of solidarity would not stand, and it revealed to me my chief concern with this station socialism. It represented revolution, but not evolution. It was simply a rotating of who would be on top. Shit would continue to roll downhill from the power structures put in place, for not even they could defy gravity. And those who kept the system going, the wheels greased, the gears lubricated, they too would also be dictated by those in charge. Nothing had changed. This mild scolding proved my skepticism of the world, for I was infallible and deserved no criticism. And the culprit behind it all waltzed back after hiding away from any direct criticism from outsiders. I rubbed his nose in the mistake he made, but he didn't even seem to understand. If the capitalist robbed the station of its labor's fruits, and the socialist proved to be authoritarian mismanagement, what hope did the working class have at all? Perhaps this new issue with the world was the bigger problem than the turbine room difficulties I had earlier. But nonetheless, I kept myself occupied with purging the contaminated air to make way for the new clean air. It was then a new science commissar approached from maintenance to inspect my lack of progress. But instead of handing me a little red book or a hero of the people medal, he gave me a stun prod. He was no revolutionary. He wasn't even a man. 
He was an A man. He bound me and sent me to his spaceship. My comrades, you would not believe the things they did to me. But in the end, I was returned to the Soviet station after my magical adventure, safe and sound, as if I was handled by Stalin Totoro himself. Bewildered, I stumbled back to engineering. It's strange how things can escalate from seemingly minor symptoms. You might feel an itching in your chest. You might start listening to lo-fi hip-hop while studying or working. Sure. It seems innocuous enough. It's just some low-key beats and a girl doing her homework. But soon it goes deeper. Soon, for unknown reason, the algorithm starts steering you towards lo-fi for ghosts only. And then after that, lo-fi for witches only. Or perhaps mermaids? Are you one of those? No, you aren't. You're definitely a landlubber. But you listen anyway. Your forsaking of your own identity is now normalized as things get weirder. And before you realize what happened, you're listening to music intended for werewolves, with chat rooms filled with degenerates. You've been ensnared by Big Fur's tech agenda and there's no going back. And it's disgusting. And like that, I'm now a damn Mothman. I never asked for this. And as I eat cotton uniforms for sustenance, I think about my current situation. As a man on the outside, on the periphery of revolution with no place in the new society or the old one, the perpetual outsider, neither capitalist nor socialist, neither wolf nor dog. This new society was supposed to be for the worker, but it couldn't even protect me from the A-mans. If society can't protect its most vulnerable, then what even is the point of society? I reconfigure the plumbing of the atmospherics room as wormholes start popping up all over the station. A crew member dives out of a wormhole into space, but I don't even care to rescue the guy. I am no longer a participant in the station. I cannot let them distract me. The whole fabric of society was sick and I never even realized it until now. You could spend all of your time at home or at the office and never look more than 20 feet ahead of you. And at that level of detail and self-absorption, everything seems fine. You could spend days or weeks doing this without ever seeing the big picture. But then if you step outside your previous boundaries and gain some perspective, you start noticing things. The very air surrounding you looks like shit. And you've been breathing it in the whole time. You didn't even realize it. So it goes too with society. It dawns on Pablo that the problem is plasma getting pumped into the engine. But at this point, I'm doubtful whether anyone would be able to fix it. When the system fails you, but you have the power to destroy your own little section of it, it becomes clear that the only true authority in the system was never acknowledged to begin with, but merely ignored and denied. But true power is not something that can be sequestered for some artificial reason or norm, and at that point it becomes your moral imperative to effect change, simply because you can. Some might call melting down a reactor terrorism, but really it is just a rearrangement of the existing state, a shuffling of the deck. The mass of the matter involved remains the same either way. And as I watch the ghost convening around the engine, I can't help but realize that all along the Hindus understood this already for millennia. I recall the Bhagavad Gita as I contemplate the approaching destruction. What's about to happen can't even be called murder, really. Anyone who thinks the soul is the slayer and anyone who thinks the soul is slain, both of them are in ignorance. The soul never slays nor is slain. The soul never takes birth and never dies at any time, nor does it come into being again when the body is created. The soul is birthless, eternal, imperishable, and timeless, and is never destroyed when the body is destroyed. How can I destroy a soul which is eternal? At most I am shedding the clothes that these souls wear. What I am doing is in fact a rejuvenation of the world. And as the singularity draws near, my thoughts go to later chapters, when Arjuna sees Krishna as he truly is and describes what he sees. As moths with great speed enter into a blazing fire to perish, similarly all these armies with great speed are entering into your mouths only to perish. And perish these moths do, my friends. The clown, with not even so much as a sad trombone to accompany his death, the singularity has no concern for your comedy. And some spaceman hanging around atmospherics, that was not your place to be. A doctor, or should I say a spin doctor. The quartermaster who is given no quarter. 
the slime that my fire birthed, I immediately consume, like Cronus and his offspring. Hail the Singuloth, the eater of worlds, the splendor of a thousand suns are upon you. The lighter of flames, that which it doesn't absorb, it ignites. And what's this? A blob? Glory be. Should ever the two meet? Alas, it was not to be. Amid the original flurry of activity, the singularity does what it usually does, wander aimlessly. For the singularity is not a god, it is not even a man. It does not move with purpose, but rather randomly. And after a while, the randomness will only find those that try to find it. But in the end, it was I who set it loose. And it is for that reason that the blob invariably triumphs. Although surely it is only a matter of time before it too gets eaten by the singularity.